ahead and get started. Welcome to Saturday Science. It's good to see you all. I'm really glad that you are tuning in. This is the last in our series of Saturday Science lectures hosted by the McDonald Center for the Space Sciences. I'm, I'm Brad Jolliffe and I'm the director of the Mac Center and I get to introduce this morning's speaker. Um, I, <clears throat> I'll tell you that uh, Paul Byrne is a very dynamic speaker and you're in for a real treat. We saved the best for last this year. And again, this is the, the last in the series. And um, I presume we'll be picking up in the spring and perhaps um, Mike Ogilvie will say a few words about that at the end. So um, let me just say a few words about Paul. He is uh, new to the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences this year. We're delighted to have him. He's a planetary scientist, planetary geologist, and he has studied and worked on missions for pretty much all of the terrestrial planets and his interests span the entire solar system. He has been leading the National Academy of Sciences decadal survey uh, panel for the investigation and exploration of Venus. So the forgotten planet, if you will, Earth's twin, and he's going to tell us all about this this morning and perhaps some things that, uh, that you didn't know and give us a peek into the future of what's going to be uh, happening with Venus. So perhaps it will no longer be the forgotten planet. So Paul, why don't you go ahead and share your screen and take it away. Okay, thank you very much for that very kind introduction, Brad. Thank you. I just want to confirm that you can hear me and that you can see my yes. slides. Awesome. Okay. Yes, very good. Cool. Thank you again, and thank you everybody for joining us this morning. This for this uh, this class, this uh, this talk. Um, yeah. So as as Brad said, I'm going to kind of overview some of the stuff we know about uh, the geology of Venus, and in fact, the planet as a whole. Um, you see, you can see that I've titled it "Some New Insights into the Geology and Exploration of Venus." Uh, you could teach a course for an entire semester, an entire year on on Venus, and even then be left with the clear impression or clear understanding that we still don't know all that much about this world. And, and as Brad said, it, it has for a long time been the forgotten world, essentially, in the portfolio of solar system exploration. Um, I will not trigger myself into a rant about how this has not been optimal, but we had some terrific news this summer when uh, NASA and ESA between them have picked, announced the selections of three new missions to Venus in the coming decade, which is going to revolutionize our understanding of the second world and fundamentally answer or tackle the question, why is a planet so similar to Earth, not like Earth? Or perhaps the converse, why is Earth a world so similar to Venus, not like Venus? And this is a, implications for our understanding of our own world on the most fundamental level. So I'm going to introduce you to the planet and talk through some of the things we know about its geology and its climate history, because the two are very, very intimately linked. And then I'll share a little bit with you about some of the key questions we have that we've yet to answer, and they're pretty important questions. I'm going to talk a little bit about some studies that I've led in the last year that we've published and what they contribute to our understanding of the planet, past and present. And then I'm going to finish by talking briefly about some of these missions that are coming down the line and what they're going to be able to tell us. So to start off as a sort of a primer for Venus, it's worth viewing Venus as an Earth-sized world in the habitable zone of a main sequence star. So it's 82% Earth mass, but it's 95% Earth radius. And what that means is, if we, were, uh, if we were alien astronomers a few tens of light years away with our squiddy tentacles uh, controlling telescopes and peering at the solar system, we would not be able to distinguish the surface properties of Earth and Venus. We could tell them apart, but their radius, uh, radii values are so similar, they are within the, uh, the error measurements that we have which means that on the basis of size alone, we couldn't make any predictive statements about what their surfaces are like or whether they'd be similar or not. Venus orbits about 70% farther from, uh, as far from the sun as we do. So it, it orbits at about 0.72 AU. We are at one AU, one astronomical unit. Uh, so all things being equal, which they're not, Venus doesn't re receive very much more sunlight than Earth, which means all things being equal and they're not. Venus's surface shouldn't be very much warmer than Earth. And for a long time, right through at least until the 50s, there was a view, uh, certainly within science fiction circles, but even with amongst some astronomers and some planetary scientists, uh, which was a very fledgling discipline at the time, that perhaps the surface of Venus was covered in lush tropical rainforests. Uh, they envisaged a warmer, more moist version of Earth. 
The first successful interplanetary flyby ever by anything that humans sent was the Mariner 2 probe, which flew past Venus in 1962. And uh, as, as an aside, you might be surprised to know that at least in the 60s and 70s, Venus was the go-to world, not Mars, for planetary exploration. The first successful soft landing, the first image recorded from the surface of another planet, the first sounds recorded from an image of the surface of another planet, all Venus. But the Mariner 2 probe that NASA dispatched as part of the Mariner series in the 60s returned two fascinating findings. One was that the lower atmosphere, and therefore by implication the surface of Venus, was extraordinarily hot, hundreds of degrees Celsius. So that immediately put pay to the idea of these, trush, uh, these lush tropical rainforests. And Mariner 2, one of the most interesting things that it found was, was actually something that it didn't find. It found no evidence for an intrinsic magnetic field, which was surprising because on paper, Venus and Earth really ought to be the same. They're about the same size. They orbit the same star. They're made of about the same stuff in about the same proportions and they're the same age. So how is it that you have two worlds on paper very similar from another planetary system, indistinguishable, and yet vastly different surface and interior properties? Our exploration of Venus continued. We learned, for example, that the atmosphere of Venus is about 97% CO2. Venus's atmosphere has a high D to H ratio, a deuterium to hydrogen ratio. I'm going to come back to that in a couple of minutes. Its atmosphere is super rotating. Its atmosphere takes a few days to complete one revolution around the planet's axis, whereas the planet itself, the solid body, takes 243 days to complete one revolution. So that we call that a super rotating atmosphere. The atmosphere rotates super fast compared to the surface. Uh, the reason for why is still unknown. There is a global cloud layer. That is to say that the reason Venus looks so beautiful in our, in our evening or our morning sky is the even star or the, or the morning star, uh, Lucifer, which I quite like, is simply because it has a globally uh, uh, encapsulating shroud of clouds that happen to be actually H2SO4, sulfuric acid clouds, pretty bad. These clouds have a very high albedo. They reflect a lot of the sunlight that reaches Venus. They also prevent us seeing the surface of Venus in the visible wavelengths. We cannot see through the clouds to the surface. We cannot see through the atmosphere the way we can on Earth or Mars or worlds without atmospheres. There has been some limited exploration of Venus in situ exploration of the Venus atmosphere. In the 1980s, the Soviet Union flew two missions called Vega, Vega 1 and 2, which were nominally missions to Hades Comet, but they used Venus as a gravity assist, and in doing so actually deployed uh, spacecraft landers and balloons into the surface of Venus. And in fact, for about 44 hours each, two balloons floated at an altitude of around somewhere between 55 and 60 kilometers in the atmosphere of Venus. What was interesting and, and had been predicted already was that at around those altitudes, it is some of the most Earth-like conditions anywhere else in the solar system. At around 55 kilometers, the temperature and pressure are comparable to room temperature. Uh, sure, you're floating above sulfuric acid clouds. Uh, there's almost no water. The UV radiation is quite high because there's not a lot of shielding. And of course, if anything happens and you fall off your balloon, you're going to be killed in the most horrific way, Z, plural, as you fall to the surface. But you could potentially put astronauts on a large gondola on a very large airship. And as long as they're wearing some sort of rebreather mask, they could actually fairly comfortably stand outside in shirt sleeves, which is remarkable. We also know that there are highly variable atmospheric conditions, both vertically and uh, horizontally from the limited data these balloons were able to return, but they did not come with cameras and they had a very, very simple set of instruments. So our, again, our understanding in situ was, was highly limited. Uh, the surface itself is hell made real. The temperature at the surface of Venus is that of a self-cleaning oven. Often people describe the surface temperature of Venus as hot enough to melt lead. And I personally have no intuition for the temperature required to melt lead. But I do know that if my oven is in its self-cleaning mode, I don't go near it. That is the prevailing ambient temperature of the surface of Venus. The pressure is about the equivalent of being a kilometer under the ocean on Earth. And that is simply because the, there is so much atmosphere. <clears throat> in fact, at the surface of Venus, the atmosphere pressure, uh, the, the physics of this carbon dioxide dominated atmosphere is almost like a supercritical carbon dioxide ocean. You can almost imagine it's being in the sea. The surface, however, from the limited in situ chemical data we have is basaltic. I'm skipping over a lot of nuance. There's lots of different kinds of basaltic rocks and there's some evidence for slightly different kinds of composition, but broadly speaking, it's the same kind of stuff that we find that characterize the seafloors on Earth and the surfaces, the volcanic parts of the moon and uh, most of the surface of Mars and Mercury. So basalt is your standard common or garden rock. If you go a thousand million light years, uh, you're going to find rocks that are made of basalt. 
Then our 13 and 14 were among the six or so landers that successfully soft landed and operated on the Venus surface. All of the successful soft landing operating vehicles on the surface of Venus have been, were deployed by the Soviet Union in the 70s and 80s. Then our 13 and 14 returned photos of the surface. They returned the first color photographs of the surface. Um, and what they interestingly showed were sedimentary like rocks. The surfaces uh, were very, really either it's kind of weird platy like texture. There's a computer kind of generated version of what these images look like here on the bottom of this image. Sometimes we saw blocks and boulders, but we didn't see the kind of standard lava flow features that we might see in volcanic settings on Earth, which was curious. And like I said a few minutes ago, the first recording of sound on another planet, uh, the microphones on Venera 13 and 14 record the sound of the Venusian wind along with, with machinery noises of the landers themselves. Uh, one of the most interesting things that we learned when NASA's Magellan mission got to Venus, it was deployed in 1989. It operated from 1990 through 1994 in, the, uh, in, in Venus orbit. It carried a very powerful radar, an S-band radar, able to penetrate through that global cloud layer and actually show us the surface. And the, one of the most surprising discoveries of many was that there are, there's a, a dearth of craters, a noticeable dearth of impact craters. And the reason this is important is because we use craters um, in, um, amongst other things to make estimates for the model age of a planetary surface. It's all predicated on the idea that the older a surface is, the more time it's, it's been able to accrue a cratering record. And therefore, all things being equal, they're often not. One place with fewer craters than another is likely to be younger than the place that has more craters. There's only about 950 or so craters on the surface of Venus, which is astonishingly low. None is below three kilometers in diameter, probably because, at least in the, in the recent epoch, the atmosphere protects the surface from smaller impactors that would make craters three kilometers in diameter or smaller. Those impactors burn up. Uh, but interestingly, there are no giant impact basins. The largest impact basin is the shade under 300 kilometers in diameter, which is pretty big, but we do not see the thousand kilometer diameter uh, impact basins that we see, for example, on, on Mercury or Mars or the moon. They surely were present on Venus, just as surely as they were present on Earth. But on Earth, things like plate tectonics, subduction, uh, erosion, the fact that we have an active hydrosphere, all serve to remove any evidence of these ancient basins. So something has destroyed or, or removed the record of these large impact basins on Venus. And tellingly, the distribution of these impact craters is indistinguishable from random. That doesn't mean they're randomly distributed. It just means that we cannot distinguish it from there being a random distribution. Although interestingly, the distribution is not random with respect to geology. But the fact is the surface of Venus is on grow, the visible preserved surface, surprisingly young. Average, uh, the estimates for its average surface age are somewhere up order 750 million years. That's not young, but it's much younger than the average integrated surface ages of Mercury, Mars, or the moon. It's comparable to the average surface age of Earth, which is a few hundred million years when you average it all out. So something has served to remove these craters on Venus. One of the big questions that we had is whether or not, and, and this is something that some of these missions began to tackle, is, is there evidence for activity? Venus Express, a European Space Agency mission, which operated from 06 to 2014, uh, found transient hotspots, areas where local temperature increases lasted for a little while and then went back to ambient. Uh, potentially consistent with lava flows, even though the surface is very hot, a basaltic lava flow will still be many hundreds of degrees hotter still and will therefore shine or show up on these, on these maps of, um, of, of temperature. Uh, some evidence from the thermal emissivity of lavas that might suggest they're young. I'm going to not go into this in too much detail. Just suffice to say that there are places where it seems on the basis of how much radiation and the manner in which that radiation is being radiated from the surface in the infrared and near infrared suggests that some surfaces are rougher than others and that roughness may denote relative youthfulness because as those lavas haven't been exposed long enough to say the prevailing environment to be eroded or weathered down. Uh, a big question is whether or not there is that we do know that the amount of SO2 in the atmosphere does seem to be variable on yearly and decadal time scales. The reasons why are not clear. Uh, however, there is an argument that the global layer of H2SO4 of sulfuric acid clouds uh, is not photochemically stable over millions or billions of years and therefore must be con continuously replenished with SO2 and H2O with water and sulfur dioxide two classic volatiles that come out of volcanoes. And so it is read, it is led to this question as to whether or not there is active volcanism. Personally, I would be astonished if Venus were not volcanically active today, simply on the basis of how big it is. But we've yet to find any smoking gun, figuratively or literally, evidence for active volcanism on Venus.
So kind of going over all this, uh, before I kind of leave this part of the talk, I just want to leave you with the fact that right now we have kind of two prevailing hypotheses on the basis of chemical evidence, on the basis of some of the geolo geological evidence we see, mainly on the basis of what we see in the atmosphere itself chemically. We have two hypotheses for how to explain present Venus. Venus is in what we call a runaway greenhouse effect, or it's a runaway greenhouse. And that basically means that for foreseeable past, Venus has trapped more heat than it's able to release that it gets from the sun, which is the same idea of how greenhouse gases warm the atmosphere and Earth. And in fact, greenhouse gases are extremely important and are thought to have played a key role in keeping early Earth warm when the sun was in fact quite a bit dimmer and producing much less radiation than it is today. So greenhouse gases are important. The problem is if you have too many of them, then you can end up in this runaway scenario. And that's what we think happened to Venus at some point in its past. The question is whether or not Venus was always like this or whether something happened after a period of essentially perhaps clement or even Earth-like conditions. So one of our models is that Venus, by virtue solely of being formed quite close to the sun, was never able to cool down enough. Energy from solar heating, energy from heat energy from large impacts that produce those basins that we presume were there and now are gone. Uh, even impact, or even energy from the very act of forming in the first place was such that the surface temperature of Venus was, was so high that even though there might have been a lot of water vapor and other volatiles in this thick atmosphere formed early on, Venus was never able to cool down enough to condense that water out into standing bodies of liquid water, i.e. lakes, seas, oceans. And in the process was never able to cool itself down enough to become Earth-like, to have meaningfully Earth-like conditions. And so this, this scenario one is that Venus in its present state essentially represents what it was like from the moment it formed. Once it, it, it went through what we call a magma ocean phase very early on, but from that point on, end of, that's it, game over. It was being terrible from the start. The alternative hypothesis is that perhaps for a time, perhaps for quite a long time, Venus might actually have been Earth-like, not just earth size, but meaningfully Earth-like. Now, I mentioned a few minutes ago that we found these elevated D to H ratios in the atmosphere of Venus. In the atmosphere of Venus. Deuterium to hydrogen ratio is a ratio we've measured from Mars and we know it for Earth. Uh, but the ratio uh, of deuterium, which is essentially an isotope of, of hydrogen, uh, it's, it's about 100 times higher in Venus than it is on Earth. And the best explanation we have for this value is simply that at some point in the past, Venus has lost a substantial amount of water. It's lost it to space. That water was probably split by photolysis, by, by solar energy, into its component hydrogen and oxygen. The hydrogen was lost to space, the oxygen went somewhere, that's an open question, possibly to the rocks. Uh, but the point is that it, it suggests that at some point in the past, Venus had much more water than it does now. We don't know how much, perhaps as much as an Earth's ocean, perhaps more depending on a lot of variables we don't really have good constraints on. Uh, our big question is whether or not that water was steam in scenario one, and therefore was never meaningfully habitable and always was hellish. Or scenario two is that that water was in fact liquid in the liquid phase. Modeling work in the last 18 months or so has suggested that if Venus was able to get out of that early heating phase, the way we suspect Earth did, Earth probably started off extremely hot as well, but was just perhaps a little farther from the sun. Maybe it had clouds, maybe it had some other stochastic elements to it that allowed it to cool down enough to condense liquid water early on. If Venus was able to do that too, perhaps by having a hemisphere spanning cloud deck that could reflect a lot of that early sun's light, maybe, then Venus could actually have been blue for quite a long time. Maybe not green, as shown in this Arctic suppression, but certainly blue. For a time, there may have been two large blue marbles. People often talk about uh, Mars being blue. I personally don't think there's good evidence that Mars is ever blue. Yes, it had uh, transient bodies of liquid water standing and flowing on the surface, but whether or not it had a meaningful hydrosphere uh, in the style of Earth is, is an open question. It's just, it's very small. It lost its heat quite quickly. Venus may actually have looked like Earth for a long time. And some of the most recent modeling suggests that, in fact, it may have retained that condition up until as recently as about a billion years ago, when something intrinsic to the planet itself, potentially widespread, voluminous, catastrophic volcanism, might actually have changed the scene. Big questions. I'll talk about how we're going to solve them in a little while. Okay, so there are some pretty important questions. We don't know the history of the loss of atmospheric water. We got measurements from Mariner 5 and 67, Pioneer Venus and 78, both NASA missions that told us about this elevated D to H ratio. 
They raise the possibility of these formerly present oceans, but we don't know if this is the case. So we do not have good measurements yet or good handle on what Venus's early history was presumably like. We do not know why the atmosphere is undergoing this or has this super rotation property. We do know that there uh, is a complex cloud structure in the infrared and ultraviolet. This is one of my favorite images, Kevin Gill, at JPL process this image from Akatsuki. This is an Akatsuki image, which is an active mission right now that the Japanese space agency has in orbit of Venus, which is a terrific story about orbiting, which I'll come back to if I have time. But you can see cloud structure. Most of the images are too low resolution to see detailed cloud structure, but you can see structure in the Venus cloud deck, which is like, there's virtually no images that look like this anywhere else. So this is just a terrific thing, but we do not know. We know from what Akatsuki has told us in the infrared and ultraviolet, the, 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 the vertical and the lateral properties of the atmosphere are, are complex and they can change over fairly short periods of time. We know there, there can be huge standing gravity waves as the atmosphere interacts very strongly with the surface, with topography, uh, but we do not know why the surface, why the atmosphere super rotates. We do not know why the atmosphere moves about 60 times faster than the solid body. And tellingly, we also do not know uh, whether or not the atmosphere itself, as, as some people have proposed, may actually have slowed the rotation of the solid body itself. So there are some fundamental questions uh, about the Venus atmosphere that even its structure, much less its composition, we don't understand. One of the most basic things we don't understand is what the surface is made of. So I've told you that it's basaltic and we estimate that it's basaltic on the basis of very limited elemental data that we have from those few landers that were able to, to land successfully to operate on the surface. Uh, it won't surprise you to hear that if you were sitting uh, in what amounts to a supercritical CO2 ocean, that's the temperature of a self-cleaning oven and the pressure of about a kilometer under the water, that's not a great environment for electronics to last. And it turns out that, in fact, these, these Soviet landers operated for between one and two hours each. Now, in fact, the limiting factor of those, those landers was actually the time they could broadcast data back to either the orbiter or the relay vehicle that, was, that would take the signal and be back to Earth. You know, after an hour or two, you know, because it takes about an hour to get to the surface, after not very much time on the surface, the, uh, the, the, the vehicle you're broadcasting to is passed out of range. Um, so they may actually have lasted a little longer, but we're talking perhaps a few tens of minutes more. These things. We are technologically, although I'll, I'll touch off this at the end, for the time being, we are technologically challenged in having something like a, a Mars rover, think uh, Opportunity, which lasted for something like 14 years on the surface of, of Mars. We're challenged in terms of the technology requirements to actually make that happen. For the time being, we're focused on a short-lived lander, but we have pretty important questions. We saw blocky terrain in the Venera 9 photos. This is an artist's impression of what the surface of Venus might look like. We do not have any high resolution images. The images are not great quality, but they are, they're tantalizing, not great quality. Um, but we, we don't know what the surface is made of. We don't have meaningful mineralogical or petrological information that tell us what the rocks are made of. We don't have trace elements, which are extremely potent markers of the history of how that rock was made and perhaps where in the planet's interior it came from. We, we just don't have that information. Uh, critically, we've seen from the images we returned by the Venera 9, 10, 13, and 14 landers, morphologically varied landscapes. But because the images of the lander scale are, are at a much finer resolution than the global radar scale data we have, or the global scale data we have from radar, we can't link the two yet. On Mars and on the moon, we can go from orbit to outcrop because we have sufficiently high resolution images from space and we have rovers or landers on the surface. We can't join, we can't close that gap for Venus yet. So we don't really have a good way of relating what we see at the global or even regional scale radar to the actual images of the surface we have. Not yet, we will get there, but we don't have it right now. Uh, and uh, even the tesserae, which I'm gonna talk a bit more about in a few minutes, the tesserae are a fascinating aspect of Venus. They're a type of rock. Well, no, let me back up on that. They are often treated as a type of rock. They're not. It's a type of land surface texture or terrain. The word tessera is not a geological word that we have on Earth, for example. It was coined by Russian scientists in the Venera 15 and 16 missions in 85, when they, who were the first people to, to see through with radar to the surface of Venus, identified some interesting looking terrain that seemed to be morphologically distinct from most of the rest of the surface. And they, they called it originally parquet terrain because it sort of evoked the idea of those parquet tiles which sort of intersect. Uh, and then they replaced that word with tessera, which ultimately comes from the word tile. But the reason it was called this is because tessera, which uh, occupy about 8%, well, between seven and 8% of the surface of Venus. So not a huge amount, although, it's worth pointing out that the 
surface area of Venus is three times the land surface area on Earth. Because of course, 71% of the surface on Earth is covered in oceans. So we can't see the land underneath it. But it, it, there's a lot of land on Venus. It's three times the continental land, basically, on Earth. Uh, but about seven and a half, eight percent of that of that surface is covered in this tesserated material. Uh, we don't know what it is. We just know that it looks highly deformed. It's rough, so it tends to look kind of brighter in radar data. This is a radar mosaic. I've color coded. I've colored kind of brown a little bit. We don't know the color of the surface of Venus really. Um, but you can see that there is lots of places where stuff is dark. And this actually, this is a small splotch. The field of view here is a few hundred kilometers across. But there, there are huge expanses of the surface of Venus that look like this. Anything in radar that's dark usually means that it's relatively smooth at the wavelength of the radar. So you can see there's a big smooth splotch here and a smooth splotch there. And in fact, you can see a little lighter patch here. It looks very like a lava flow. So that's led to the idea that a lot of this stuff, this darker stuff, both within tesserated regions and elsewhere, is lava. But the tesserated themselves, they're kind of brighter. They're not bright. Some bits that face the radar being more a bit bright, but they're brighter, right? They're less dark. And that usually tells us that the stuff is relatively rough. Um, but it's got these weirdo looking structures. Like these things look like weird folds. Uh, in fact, that's what some of us think. But you can see there's a lot of fractures going through. There's fractures here. So a bunch of fractures there, a bunch of fractures there. We don't know what the tesserae are. And we also don't know, tesserae just means deformed, really. It doesn't tell us what the rock is made of or what it was originally before it got fractured and folded. Um, however, there are places where tesserae are manifest that are topographically high and appear to have thick crust. And there are places on Earth that are topographically high and appear to have thick crust. And we call them continents. And the continents on Earth are... Areas are made of a type of rock that requires, we think, large volumes of water and also tend to have uh, elevated amounts of radiogenic or heat producing elements, which we think we found in some areas or at least adjacent to some tesserae. The Venera 8 lander in 72 didn't land on a tesserae. We've never done that, but, but landed near enough to suggest that perhaps some of these tesserae may actually have elevated radiogenic elemental abundances, which is consistent with them being something like a continent. And if they are, and there's a lot of ifs here, but if the tesserae are like continental material, uh, they, their volume is such that it would suggest they form in the presence of liquid water, which would be a big contributing factor towards Model 2. Like model 1 is where the planet was terrible forever. Model 2 is that it was Earth-like until perhaps as recently as a billion years, geologically recently. Could be that the tesserae actually kind of feed into that Model 2. We don't know, but we do know that they're very interesting kinds of rock. We don't know what they are, and and and, and we really should. And one of the big questions we've had is, is the planet geologically active? Now, I alluded to the fact there might be active volcanic activity, largely coming from some tantalizing hints of changes in temperature at the surface and things like variable amount of SO2 in the atmosphere. Is the planet tectonically active? Again, I said to you a little while ago that I would be astonished if it turned out that it wasn't volcanically active. I would be astonished if Venus turned out not to be tectonically active. Uh, we saw from the Magellan data widespread tectonic deformation, vast expanses of lava plains cut through, riven with tectonic structures, and some places where we have enormous mountain belts that really don't look all that dissimilar to, say, the Himalayas on Earth. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that Venus is actively deforming now, uh, but we don't know for sure. And we still have some questions as to what actually how that activity might manifest. Now, I've, I've noted here mobile lithospheric blocks. I'm going to come back and talk about this in a couple of minutes. Onto the, actually, I'm going to talk about it right now in the next topic, recent findings. So this is where I do a little bit of um, a little bit of self-promotion here, I guess, here. I'm going to share with you very briefly the results of two papers that we've published in the last 18 months or so uh, that contribute to we hope, some understanding of what might be happening in Venus today. So I'm going to show you a couple of radar images taken from these papers and just briefly talk you through what we think we're seeing here and what that might mean for present and past Venus. Uh, so I've told you that Venus is heavily tectonized. We know that in places that tectonic deformation is distributed across huge regions, whereas in other places that tectonic deformation is concentrated or focused into narrow belts. And we, we've known this since the uh, late 80s, early 90s, when Magellan data started coming back. So for 30 years, we've known this. This is not new. Uh, but what we were able to show in this paper we published earlier this year in the Proceeding National Academy of Sciences is that in places, some of these bands of deformation actually delimit or demarcate relatively low-lying planes. 
that themselves are much less deformed. This is the biggest example we had. You can kind of see we have an outline here in dashed yellow. So I hope you can see that. And inside this area of dashed yellow line, this area is relatively undeformed. Yeah, it's got some cracks through it, sure. By the way, I want to just point out to you, look at the scale bar. That scale bar from stem to stern is a thousand kilometers. So this, this area we're looking at here, is about 2,500 kilometers across. In fact, the area here within this dashed yellow line has the same area as the state of Alaska. So this is not a small, modest part of Venus. Uh, and inside this area, yeah, sure, there's some cracks, but there are also some craters that we can see marked by the black arrows. There are some lava flows marked by the, the white arrows. But its outline or its, its kind of perimeter is very highly textilized, much more so than the interior. And when we get the eye in and we look, at some parts of this outline. Here's box B blown up here a little bit. The radar image here, in this case, it's what we call a right look image. That means that the radar beam is coming in from the right. So you can see any feature that faces the right, the east, happens to be illuminated. Anything facing the west or the left happens to be dark. So this it looks like an image. You can, for our purposes, treat it as if the sun is shining from the right hand side. It's actually the radar beam and then it's processed. But, but the point is, here is an area that's still not small. This is That scale bar is 40 kilometers. This whole image here is about 100 kilometers across. Now, if you've ever been to Ireland, which is where I'm from, Ireland is about 150 kilometers across. So like that's Ireland. This is not a small part of Venus. And there's a huge amount of what we call extensional deformation here, which means the ground's being pulled apart. But in addition to the ground's being pulled apart, which is standard stuff, you see that on many worlds around the solar system, there's something else happening here. Where the gold arrows are, we think we're seeing these kind of S-shaped looking structures. This is a kind of a sketch map to go with the image here, so you can see what we think we're seeing. And in addition to the ground being pulled apart, we think the ground is also sliding side to side. Doesn't matter which way, right now that just suggests that we think, we think on the basis of the shapes here, that the ground slid top to the left, right? That we call that, uh, technically speaking, we call that sinistral transtension, but the words don't matter. What matters is, in addition to the ground being pulled apart, the ground shifted laterally. If we take a look at box C down here, this part in the southwest, we see these big, so again, scale bar areas about 100 kilometers across, see these big curving structures like this. Our best explanation for that is, in addition to pulling the ground apart, you are also shifting it, in this case, top to the right, or dextral transtension. In fact, there's a box up here, D, here, again, every time we're looking at these images, the radar illumination direction is coming from the right. So you can imagine like the light is coming from the right, sort of. And you'll see again here these kinds of ridges like this. And these ridges have this kind of funny S looking shape, right? We call that a sigmoidal pattern. Again, the words don't matter so much, but what the red arrows are showing, we maintain, is evidence for not only the ground being pushed together, but at the same time it's being pushed together, it's shifting side to side. And we would call this dextral transpression. But again, those are just technical words to describe the fact that where we see a lot of tectonic activity happening, stuff is jostling side to side as well. There are regions in the, uh, on the Venus surface where we see huge expanse of this kind of, te this kind of tectonic activity or, or activity taking place. This is an area called Lavinia Planitia. It's in the southern hemisphere, in the uh, southern uh, part of the western hemisphere. And we see these belts and they seem to delineate or, or, or kind of divide up these individual crystal blocks. So these dashed, and, and in places where I couldn't see the edge, I dotted them, see these dashed yellow lines that outline these relatively low lying areas full of lava plains. And I can see, even see volcanoes in them. But look at the scale bar here, you got 600 kilometers. So this is about a thousand kilometers across. But the point is that between these relatively low lying, relatively undisturbed areas are these really highly tectonically deformed areas. And they get really, really complicated. But when we start getting the eye in again, we look at say box B here, we see, we argue, evidence of these kind of sigmoidal or S-shaped ridges again, suggesting that the ground is pushed together and moved simultaneously. Box C, again, another example. In this case, it went top to the left here, it's going top to the right. We see these kind of, again, these sigmoidal ridges. And again, this field of view is hundred kilometers across. This is a huge field area. It would take you months to map this. It just looks small on the screen because the radar data aren't great quality in terms of resolution. Here's box D. We see, we think, evidence for the ground being pulled apart. And yet also the best way of explaining this kind of weird, wavy, wiggly kind of structure, that shape there, is that in addition to pulling the ground apart, you've also shifted, in this case, top to the right. The significance of the top to the left or top to the right, which way it's, it's laterally shifting, doesn't matter. We can't even back out the timing of this all that well, except we do know that it must happen after the planes get put in because the planes are deformed. 
those ba- big, vast expanses of lava plains that are formed. So we know they had to be there before this activity happened. Those plains are geologically young. We don't know how young. They just have very, very few impact craters. Them, so they must be geologically young. Maybe they're 100 million years old. That's not young, you say. You're correct. 100 million years ago, hominids were nowhere on the scene. But geologically, 100 million years is not that long. And this property, this deformation happened perhaps 100 million years ago, which is guess, educated guess, guess though. Well, it's pretty unlikely that over 4,400 million years, this process will take place and then perhaps stop. So I think this tells us that the planet is actively deforming today, but so far we have not been able to test that hypothesis uh, simply because we haven't had the data. However, the best explanation we have for the patterns we're seeing here is that there are parts of the crust, that outer brittle solid shell that have been broken up and they are jostling and moving and rotating and translating and chimming like pack ice does. It's clearly not pack ice. And it may, we don't really know for sure what's doing this. We think actually the mantle is moving, much like on Earth. We need to test that. But we think there are parts of the surface of Venus that are fragmented, just like pack ice, and they shift and shimmy, just like pack ice. That's the analogy we're using. And some of that deformation has got to be taking place recently, if not today. We published another paper late last year in geology where we looked at the tesserae. Now, I mentioned to you that the tesserae are these really weird, highly deformed rocks. We don't know what tesserae are made of. Uh, we don't know when they were in place. They tend to be the oldest stuff we see because everything else always seems to sit on top of them. Uh, and remember, the word tesserae really should be seen as a way to describe how a rock, it, it, the appearance of a rock. It doesn't really tell us anything about what it's made of. And we might have different part places where there are tesserated rocks. In fact, this is a map here in the top right. All the stuff in red on the global surface of Venus is tesserated. So again, you can see it's only about 8%. It's not all that much, but it's widespread. It's distributed in different parts of the planet. Uh, this is an example of a place I'm going to show you up here. Just one example. There are several we published on, but this is one I'm going to show you up here in the uh, mid-latitudes in the Eastern Hemisphere, a place called Tellus Tessera. Um, just because something is called a tessera here, in the Western Hemisphere and here in the Eastern does not mean that it's the same rock, nor does it mean they're the same age or that the deformation is the same age. We really know so little about this rock, but it's tantalizing. It could be continental. It's certainly highly tectonically deformed. It's much more deformed than anything else we see on Venus. In fact, I maintain the tesserae are amongst the most deformed surface materials, rock or ice, we see anywhere in the solar system, perhaps second only to some of the most tectonically deformed continental interiors on Earth. But we saw some really interesting stuff that we published last year in the Tessera. In addition to the fractures and the folds and the stuff that tells just how deformed the Tessera are, we saw another feature too, which has been kind of seen by some people in the past, but not really picked up on, not really perhaps thought about in terms of what the significance is. So I want to point out briefly, I mentioned to you that when you have dark stuff with radar images, which is shown here by, say, the blue, that's usually radar smooth and often thought to mean that it might be some sort of volcanic material, let's say. Uh, this is an image here. This is a sketch map of what you're seeing here. It's the same scene in all three boxes. The middle box is a sketch, our interpretation of what we see in the first image. This is a radar image or a portion of a radar mosaic. Again, the radar beam coming in from the left this time. So you can almost treat that like, like basically the, the sun shining in from that direction. And you'll notice that where the gold arrows are, there's a bunch of these lines. Right? And we've drawn our best guess of what those lines look at, our best interpretation, in the teal lines here in the middle box. There they are. There they are. You'll see them here. Now, you'll actually notice the spacing of the lines here and here is kind of the same. Spacing gets kind of condensed here. That's probably a radar artifact. You get these things like called uh, layover and um, foreshortening and, and other kind of things that come as a function of radar beams striking, uh, basically, topography. Uh, but... So you can kind of ignore, there's no real significance in them changing their, their spacing there. But the point is you can kind of see, you can almost trace these lines across like this. And there's a bunch more up there and there's even some down here. I haven't drawn them all in. Uh, here they are in teal. And you'll notice that their, their strikes or the directions they go are quite different to the directions of the tectonic structures in the area, which are these thin black lines, which pretty much kind of go north, south, or maybe the north, northwest. And when we look with topography, now the topography for Venus is not good quality. The, the presently available topography. It's not great. There are some places where it's less bad because of some very creative processing that some folks, some very clever folks have been able to do where you can take two radar image uh, views of the same scene from slightly different perspectives and you can actually generate 3D data from them, which is kind of basically stereo, stereo photogrammetry is how stereoscopes work. Uh, but in this, the color coding here is to simply say that the dark stuff is relatively low and the yellowy, orangey stuff is relatively high. 
these apps, these are numbers given to the absolute, what we call the datum or basically sea level of, of Venus. The numbers themselves are less important than the fact that relatively speaking, areas that are yellow and orange are relatively high standing, areas that are purple or kind of navy are low standing. And where you see a lot of these lines happen to be on hill slopes. They're on the sides of ridges. And the way we think you explain this pattern, which we've seen in a bunch of different tests at different places around the planet, is that this stuff is actually, these are layers. These are layers of some kind of layered rock. We don't know what kind of rock, but there's only a kind of a finite number of rock types that are layered. And the reason they look like this is because they've been folded, perhaps. They've been eroded. And the way you get this kind of pattern then is simply because you had originally fairly flat line rock. And yeah, you can fold it, you can tilt it, you can deform it a bit but then you erode it away and you end up exposing layers here. And if you want to visualize how this looks, take a phone book. And one of those things you use for carving turkeys, I don't propose you do this, uh, but you basically could chop up your phone book and you can make some pretty complicated patterns to topography. The layers, the pages in the phone book will still be flatlined, but when you look at it from above, they can form quite complicated patterns as those layers are exposed on what amounts to hill slopes. So we've come up with this possible kind of, we propose this, this formational scenario, at least for some test rate, at least for those test rate where we see this evidence of layering, that we have some deposition of layered rock. We don't know what this rock is. We talk a bit about this in the paper. They're either probably layers of volcanic lavas or they're sediments. If they're layers of volcanic lavas, not a problem to have them formed at any time in Venus's history. If they're sedimentary rocks, there's no prospect of really making sedimentary rocks today. In which case, these parts of the test ray must date from a different climate when it was possible to deposit sedimentary rocks. But you lay them down and then you fold them. Plenty of evidence for folding. Those weird curvy things I talked about earlier when I showed you this scene, these kind of weird lenticular patterns, pretty strong evidence for folding. So now through tectonic activity, which we're not short of on Venus, you push the ground together, you create these folds. And then probably just through wind, you plane off the surfaces of these ridges over time. In doing so, you expose these constituent layers that form these kind of really distinctive patterns. And you also erode stuff off these ridges and, and fill in low-lying areas with radar dark smooth material, which historically people generally have looked at as being into evidence for volcanism. And in fact, yeah, sure, some places it's probably volcanism, but some of it might simply be the stuff sloughed off the ridges. This is one of the reasons why the test are such an important science target, because we do not know what they are made of. We do not know how old they are. We do not know what kind of climate conditions they formed in, nor what they tell us about the overall geological history of Venus. So you can imagine the test are one of the most exciting, tantalizing places for us to visit. Also, some of the most challenging because of how rough they are. That poses serious, serious risk to the safe landing of any kind of spacecraft we, we currently could develop. Now, I'm going to, for the last bit of the talk, share with you some of the most exciting stuff that's happened in the Venus community for a very long time, which is, like I said, earlier this year, NASA and ESA, between the three of them, announced three, between the two of them, three new missions to visit Venus in the coming decade. The first of two NASA missions is called Veritas. Now, you'll forgive me for not being able to recall early on a Saturday, this is early for me, what Veritas is. It's, a, it's a, like many missions uh, of, of many space agencies, it's a tortured backronym that actually means something. Venus emissivity, something, something. But the point is, Veritas is going to be an extremely capable radar orbiter. It's going to be able to carry out uh, detailed radar mapping. It will produce, uh, it, it, well, actually, we may get some INSAR, some interferometric synthetic aperture radar, which is going to help identify evidence for surface change. It's also going to provide topographic data, both in radar image and topographic data at a resolution far beyond anything we have right now, which will be critical for us to start testing some of these hypotheses we have. It will also carry an instrument payload that will measure the spectral properties of the surface. I told you that you can't really see the surface of Venus through the clouds. It turns out there are a few windows in the near infrared where you can, and Veritas is going to carry uh, instrumentation that will, will go some way towards making at least large scale estimates for what the surface might be made of chemically. Uh, it won't tell us exactly what kind of rock it is, but it will tell us, for example, how much iron the rock has. And that coupled with other data we'll be able to acquire will give us very powerful constraints on estimates for what that stuff is actually made of. And then from there, we can start building models as to how it might've gotten there. So Veritas, it's also gonna do, by the way, it's called a gravity investigation using radio science, ver purely by virtue of the fact that it has to beam data back to earth there will be a mechanism by which scientists will be able to look at the orbital maneuvering or the, the orbital trajectory of the spacecraft. And from that, 
back out information about Venus's interior. So Veritas is one of the first two NASA missions selected this summer. The other is called Da Vinci, also a tortured backronym that stands for deep something. Again, I encourage you to go to Google and ask what Da Vinci means. It was called Da Vinci Plus up until about a month or two after selection, and the team has dropped the plus, now it's back to being called Da Vinci. Da Vinci is going to have an orbiter and a relay vehicle that's going to take some chemical data. Uh, well, actually, it's going to take some structural data of the atmosphere using infrared and ultraviolet cameras. But the star of the Da Vinci show is an entry probe about a meter across that it's going to drop through the atmosphere. And as it travels through the atmosphere, it's going to take repeated measurements at different altitudes of things like noble gas abundances. It's going to measure the D to H ratio again, much more accurately. The noble gases in particular are, 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 are we are excited to get them because the noble gases are powerful tracers of the history of a planet's interior, its composition, its formation, and its degassing because of the nature of how these, these um, isotopes really don't fractionate. By looking at their relative ratios, you learn an awful lot about the early planet very, very quickly. It only takes about an hour for this probe to descend through the atmosphere before it hits the surface. But in that hour, it will return data that will revolutionize our understanding of the history of Venus. It is, we hope, we are going to get from da Vinci a definitive answer as to whether or not the planet was born with a lot of water and whether that water was lost early in scenario one when it was this hellish world from the get-go, or if in fact it was habitable potentially for billions of years. Da Vinci, in, by virtue of these chemical measurements, will hopefully answer that question for us. One of the most exciting things that I, because I, I do surface stuff more than anything else, and I just, I am fascinated by what the surface of Venus looks like. The, the entry probe is not designed to, surf, to operate in the surface. It's not a lander, but it is going to land or collide with at a maybe about 30 miles an hour. That's how fast things hit the ground because they're falling through this thick atmosphere. It's going to land on an area called Alpha Regio, one of the tesserae, which we don't know anything about, don't know what they're made of, and one of the tesserae where we found layering last year. So as you might imagine, I am particularly excited to get those images after, uh, you know, through towards the end of the descent period, uh, perhaps the last few minutes, the atmosphere is so opaque in the visible spectrum, even a few kilometers up, you can't really see the ground. But at about four kilometers or so, the atmosphere will begin to thin enough that you'll start to see the ground and it will take repeated images all the way, we hope, to just about impact. It's possible the probe will survive impact. Now, it's not designed to, and it will die pretty quickly, but it might even get a picture of like the, you know, on the surface of a, a jaunty angle or something. Uh, but I, am, I cannot wait to see what we see and whether or not we can relate, hopefully, what we see with da Vinci and its probe images to the radar data we'll get from Veritas. Now, at a, about a week after Veritas and da Vinci were defined, were, were, were announced to be selected, the European Space Agency announced that it's going back to Venus with the Envision mission. And Envision is also a radar orbiter. It's going to carry a, a capability of producing extremely high resolution radar data, up to 10 meters per pixel in places, which is about 10 fold increase of what we have with Magellan. It's also gonna be carrying a subsurface radar sounder, which no one's ever flown at Venus, which is going to be able to hopefully peer through the upper few tens or even hundreds of meters of rock to tell us what might be under some of the thin lava flows. Perhaps even are there, are there impact craters we have, we've missed that we haven't really recognized with radar data. So I cannot wait to see what the radar sounding is gonna tell us. And it's going to carry a similar suite of instruments to the Veritas mission. Uh, and, and looking for evidence of changes in surface composition using those narrow near-infrared windows. These three missions together will constitute the first fleet in what I hope, intend for there to be, a new era of Venus exploration. And in doing so, they are going to revolutionize. We are going to learn, we are going to get introduced to a whole new world. We'll be able to answer some of the questions we have. We will, be, we will inevitably have to ask hundreds more but these missions may not be alone, even though there's three of them, because there are other efforts undergoing uh, development right now. One, is the, uh, you, the Russian space agency, Roscosmos, is working on the Venera D concept. The D here stands for long-lived. The idea is basically Russia would go back and do what the Soviet Union did in the 70s and 80s, would build a much more capable, uh, more ruggedized Venera lander that would get onto the surface if it were to fly. It may also happen to carry, say, a NASA furnished thing called Lissy, which I'm going to skip over briefly, uh, just to tell you that Lissy is 
a technology demonstrator currently under development by NASA to potentially show that you can have technology operate for weeks or months mm -hmm. at the surface of Venus, thanks to silicon carbide electronics mm -hmm. instead of pure silicon. Venera D is in development by the Russian Space Agency. The Indian Space Research Organization is developing Venus Orbiter. Now, we don't know a lot about it right now, although it's supposedly slated for launch in the early 2020s, um, but the uh, Shukrayan-1 orbiter carrying an international payload of instruments uh, would go and tackle, again, some of the critical questions we have for Venus in terms of atmospheric composition, what surface properties are, is there evidence for ongoing surface tectonic or geological or volcanic activity? So that is something we may see fly in the next few years. The fact is, though, that we still are going to have major questions to answer, even with the successful completion of the Envision, Da Vinci, and Veritas missions, even if the uh, ISRO flies the uh, Venus Orbiter mission, and even if Venera D flies, there are some fun foundational questions we still have to answer about what we uh, to understand about Venus and, and how we can put all these disparate bits of information together to form a coherent uh, story for understanding Venus science. And to do that, there are new technologies that we need to develop. Either we need to develop them from the beginning or we need to develop them to the point where they can be implemented. Perhaps they exist at some level, but that we can implement them in Venus exploration. Aero capture and aero braking are technologies that have been proposed. In fact, there was a little bit of aero braking done before. Um, I think the Venus Express mission did a little bit of aero braking. Uh, but the idea of error braking and error capture, they are techniques to get into orbit using much less fuel than you would normally do and therefore be faster. They do pose risks to a spacecraft. They can be quite, uh, the, the, the stresses on a space frame can be quite, quite arduous. And so this is a thing we need to develop technologically in practice. Uh, we've seen that the Russians, the Soviet Union, flew two French-made balloons, the Vega 1 and 2 balloons in 1985, Aerial platforms have been flown by humans in Venus, but there's a lot more we could do in terms of how we would control these things, how we would navigate them. Uh, it looks like we have the ability to develop a balloon that could operate for hundreds of days, but how we, it, we would control it and where we would know it is, they're challenges, they're surmountable challenges, but they, they are challenges we have, to, we have to overcome. It's possible to do in-situ seismology and geophysical investigations from the clouds. You may know that right now there's a mission called InSight, which is a, a seismology instrument system landed on Mars in Elysium Planitia, and it's listening to Mars quakes. Uh, inside is sitting on the ground, the seismometer is sitting on the ground, coupled to the Martian, the Martian surface. On Venus, in fact, this happens on Earth too, but it's 60 times more efficient on Venus because of how thick the atmosphere is. But on Venus, when a quake happens, we predict, the energy from that quake, much of it's transferred through the solid body, but some of it goes up into the atmosphere. And we know this happens on Earth. We've measured it on Earth. We think it's 60 times more effectively coupled on Venus because of how thick that atmosphere is at the surface. And what that means is you could fly a balloon and quite capably detect evidence of seismic activity simply by waves traveling through the air that you would det detect with the seismic array on your balloon, which is incredible. You could also look for things like evidence for an ancient magnetic field using a magnetometer on a balloon. And subcloud imaging. There's a huge amount of atmospheric scattering on Venus. Even through those narrow infrared windows, you still get about 50 kilometers per single pixel when you're in orbit. But if you can get under the clouds where temperatures start to go up, they're about 150 Celsius, so this is challenging. But if you can either temporarily or deploy some sort of imaging system under the clouds, or maybe you have a camera in a probe you drop, Maybe you don't need to survive 150 Celsius or up to 470 for all that long. If you can photograph the ground in near, near infrared under the cloud deck, you can see stuff at a far greater scale without all the hassle of having to build something that actually lasts for days or weeks or months at 470 Celsius, which would be a step, a powerful step forward. Um, but we also have to have issues with, there, we have technological needs to, to land and operate on the ground. Uh, like I said, there are folks developing a silicon carbide technology, tr basically transistors that would work, the electronics that would work. In fact, folks at NASA Glenn have now shown that this technology is, is perfectly able to continue doing what it does under ambient Venus conditions, ambient Venus temperatures at least, for 60 days. So we are not that far off seeing electronics work at the surface of Venus. High temperature memory and communication is a big issue. Instruments that can process rock samples quickly, process them quickly and beam that data back, 
automated hazard avoidance and navigation, you may know that the Perseverance rover, which was touched down by Skycrane in February of this year, used for the first time ever fully autonomous terrain relative navigation systems that were developed over the last 10 years. That technology can be applied to a host of worlds, including Venus. But doing so under those conditions is challenging and technologically challenging and ultimately sustained surface operations. We are within, I hope, the next few decades, we will see landers operate for months on the surface of Venus. But it's going to require sustained technological development and, and really money, like financial input. Ultimately, I am positive we will see Venus rovers, but it's going to require a new form of technology we don't have yet right now. We can see a path to it, but it's going to take sustained investment over the coming decades, hopefully justified by the brand new science questions that are going to be asked, raised by these new, uh, this new flotilla of missions going to Venus. The future of Venus exploration is extremely bright, and I'm so excited that if I had given this talk to you a year ago, I'd be bemoaning the fact that we hadn't gone back in all these years, and these are the basic questions. We are going to have a fleet of spacecraft in orbit of Venus. Within the next 10 years, we are going to see an increasing shift toward Venus science and understanding Venus. I hope it's the start, it's the foundation of a new era of Venus exploration, where we have aerial platforms, we have balloons, we have orbiters, we have landers capable of operating for months at a time on the Venus surface. The future of Venus exploration is bright, it's multi-platform, and I cannot wait to see what we discover about Earth's twin. With that, I will end my talk. Thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. We lost your audio. Can you hear me now? I, I muted myself. Okay, okay. Brad, uh, uh, do you want me to manage the questions or do you want to, to uh, MC them? Okay, I don't know if Brad can hear me. So I see that David Moore has his hand up. So David, from Astronomy.ie, please go ahead. Okay, Thanks, know. Paul. Excellent oh, talk. <laughs> I, I was wondering about the impacts on Venus. On the Earth, small meteoroid get, gets burnt up in the atmosphere. A slightly larger object will lose its cosmic velocity and just fall as a meteorite on the ground. But eventually, I'm not sure how big they need to be, the rock will be big enough to hit the ground with cosmic velocity. I'm not sure what that is for the Earth. Perhaps you know. But is it significantly different for Venus? Well, they send up a rocket with atomic bombs and exploded. Right. Huh. Okay, so I'm going to see if can I hang on a second. Okay, so to your question, um, yeah. So David, to your question, I don't think the cosmic velocity required to punch the atmosphere is very different for the two worlds. Once, as you say, you get above a certain impact or size. We have no reason to suspect that there weren't gigantic impact basins on Venus because we know they're preserved on Mercury and we know they're preserved on Mars. So it stands to reason that anything in between got hit. Now, when and the extent to which that flux changed, the length of the environment, they're big questions that we, we don't really have good answers for yet. Um, but I think, the take-home message is there surely must have been absolutely gigantic impacts on Venus. Uh, you're right, the atmosphere would not have had any meaningful effect on an object 10 kilometers across, which for example is the size of object we think created the Chicxulub impact crater uh, 65 million years ago. 10 kilometers isn't that big. An object 50 kilometers across absolutely would have no difficulty making a gigantic impact basin. Um, it is possible that one of the big questions we have is when Venus's climate changed or, or, or became established the way it is today. Because as I said, right now, the atmosphere can protect the surface from small impactors. One of the questions that we have in trying to reconcile the cratering record, the geology we see with the history we think of the climate is, was the atmosphere always like that? Was it always able to shield small craters? And some people propose, in fact, there actually might be unrecognized small craters, perhaps in the tesserae, from a period where the atmosphere wasn't so thick, perhaps before this runaway greenhouse effect happened. But we don't have any unique constraint on any of those models, a unique point we can say, yes, this is correct and this is wrong. So we don't know is a short answer. All we can say is that there are no large impact bases now. There surely must have been. 
uh, but they have since been removed, been uh, lost. Um, if the average surface area, this is, again, I'm going to try and keep this to within, you know, the today calendar, Saturday. When I say the average surface age of Venus is around 700 million years, we do not know if the spread of ages to give us that average looks like this, and therefore there's some very young rocks and very old rocks, or if the spread of ages is very narrow. We don't know. Uh, there continues to be substantial disagreement about the, the history of volcanic resurfacing of Venus. There were models espoused very early after Magellan about what's called catastrophic resurfacing, which I think has largely fallen out of favor and I don't buy for a second. But the idea held that every 700 million years, this planet would just vomit out its interior and completely resurface itself. I suspect in real life, it's much more like what Earth does, slow and steady. But the fact remains that if it's been doing this for the last few hundred million years, very, very little of the period before then it will be preserved, including large impact basins. So I don't know if I've answered your question, David, but I, I hope that kind of helps. Yep, that's um, fine. I just thought maybe a hundred times denser had a big effect. It does on small ones, but on the ones that would make the 500, the thousand kilometer diameter basins, the, the atmosphere may, may as well not be there. It's kinetically, it has no effect. Uh, Thank you. Thanks, David. Put the first question actually, and at that time I didn't know how much it would connect with the next. Um, the question was if the rotation that we, you were talking about was around, around the axis or around the sun, comparing uh, when you talk about super rotation of the atmosphere. But then it also connects with uh, is uh, the the uh, effects on the surface, the folding, etc., or the movement is only tectonics, or it could be also heat. And if there is any difference in latitude that could reveal that if we, the rotation has something to do with that. Sure. So, so it turns out that there, there is a very small of order a few degrees temperature difference latitudinally uh, between day and night, but functionally no. Functionally from the pole to the equator, the surface is about the same temperature. Uh, the atmosphere is extremely efficient at keeping the entire surface the same temperature everywhere. Uh, and and the, the slow rotation of the solid body doesn't meaningfully make any diurnal mm. temperature change between day and night. For mm. um, I, I was more uh, worried about plasticity of the material uh, against Coriolis and so on. We don't see any evidence of, say, a pattern that might speak to the Coriolis effect having an effect. In fact, the Coriolis effect is so weak that instead of three Hadley cells per hemisphere, it's one Hadley cell per hemisphere. But the plasticity of the rock, although it's very hot, it's 400 odd Celsius, it's still quite far from the homologous temperature of the rock, which is to say that the rock will not behave plastically. And the main reason we know this is because we see very convincing evidence for brittle deformation. So the rock is relatively cold. That doesn't mean that the temperature was always what it is. And people have proposed that there could have been temperature excursions in the past, in which case the rock would actually have become a bit more plastic. And of course, you get plastic deformation very, very shallowly, much shallowly on Venus than on Earth, because you're starting off at a higher temperature. But no, functionally, rocks at the surface are brittle, basically. Okay. It doesn't seem to be interacting with the atmosphere that way. And my second question was about the percentage of uh, uh, sulfuric acid in the how active it is? What is the percentage and what does the temperature make it more active? Is, is it going to be terrible to have a you know, canopy floating there? Or Well, yeah. So I, I, I did not know, appreciate this until I read it. it was, so you may know, and I intentionally not talked about it. Phosphine was, was proposed to have been detected in the Venus atmosphere uh, within the last year or so. Uh, the detection itself is still heavily debated. Uh, the meaning of the detection for astrobiology is even more detected. I personally am agnostic about there being phosphine. I don't think there's anything alive in the atmosphere. But one thing that I did learn in reading the papers is that there's no point talking about how acidic the Venus atmosphere, the Venus clouds are in terms of pH, because they are orders of magnitude more acidic than anything the pH scale was designed to define. It's pretty bad. However, there's also, if you were to fly through uh, if you were in the clouds for a long time, yes, that poses an issue. If you were to float above the clouds, you'd be okay. Uh, you, you know, you may eventually start to see issues with the quality of the cloud, the quality of the balloon envelope, but probably from things like UV radiation as well. Um, yes, yeah, certainly being, we, we, we already have technology that we know will be chemically inert with sulfuric acid, mm -hmm. Teflon and a bunch of other mylar coatings and stuff. Um, that's not a concern. The biggest concern, yeah, with things like instruments, but the, the goal then would not to be in the cloud. The, the goal would be to be above the cloud as much as possible. Mm -hmm. But the clouds themselves are pretty acidic, yeah. Although, tellingly, 
uh, it does not rain on the surface of Venus because it's too hot. Yeah, uh, sulfuric acid isn't stable there. So it's, that, it's like if you've been to the desert in the US, for example, you might see rain in the afternoon that doesn't reach the ground. That's a bit like what happens on Venus. How is the rest of the atmosphere in terms of composition, apart from the clouds? It's all CO2. I mean, there's trace elements, oh, okay. there's some nitrogen and stuff, but it's 97% okay. CO2. That's, that's quite enough. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Marcio. Hi, Professor. Thank you very much for your theoretic presentation. Uh, congratulations. Uh, I'd like to ask, uh, ask you about uh, if the next radar mission could indicate the presence of salt on the surface of Venus, is it could be a sign that there were oceans in the past of this planet? Yeah, so I think, are you kind of getting at the question of whether there might be evidence of, say, evaporites, right? Like layers of salt-rich rock that were originally deposited in water and the water evaporated. That's a big question and we don't know. Um, it's possible, yeah, that we might find some of that kind of rock type. Um, like I said, you know, we, we think we see layers in the tesserae, although tesserated rocks are, are high deformed. Just because there's probably a load of stuff we, we don't see with the quality of the radar we have right now. And like I said, we have extremely limited chemical information. That said, um, salt-rich rocks, um, halite as a, a salt mineral, um, you know, gypsum, any kind of evaporite, they're probably not stable chemically at the surface. It's almost certain that they've been chemically altered by the atmosphere. But we, we don't have a great control on what that chemical alteration is. And so what's been happening in the last five years in particular, longer, but in the last five years in particular, there's been a big focus on developing new laboratory technology to simulate Venus conditions to actually characterize the mineral reactions that might take place. Because even if there had been, say, evaporites there, it's a very unlikely they would be they would be still evaporites. They've been altered into something else. We don't have a good handle of what they'd be altered into. We've got some ideas. Um, so working that out or ruling that out is probably going to be quite difficult. Um, but high resolution <laughs> radar data, mm -hmm. in situ chemical data eventually, and laboratory work on Earth, all together will help us answer that question. It's okay. certainly possible, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so uh, there are questions in the chat as well, I see. So um, Liliana, I think you had asked about your questions. Dan asked, how much background radiation is there on the surface? Um, I actually don't know. There's not that much because the atmosphere is extreme. There's no intrinsically generated magnetic field, but the atmosphere will protect a lot of the surface from radiation. So that is not a concern the way it is, say, for example, on the surface of the moon or Mars. Unfortunately, it's sort of academic because although the pro is not much radiation, the con is crushing pressure, horrific temperature, um, and a bunch of other things that might kill you. So it's still going to be a challenging place for human operations. But in terms of radiation, I don't think radiation is much of a problem with the surface by virtue of just how thick that atmosphere is. Uh, Chet Jankowski asks, in the absence of a magnetic field and the flux emitting from the sun, is it possible the flux can be responsible for the atmospheric velocity? We don't know what the relationship between the sun and the atmosphere is. Uh, it's possible, but I don't think so. Uh, the, I think it's probably more likely that, well, actually, there's not a very good explanation for the super rotation. Um, one possibility is that it's not so much that the atmosphere is moving quickly, it's that the planet is moving slowly, the solid body. So one possibility is you may have a world, that, because even the atmosphere still takes about four days to, to do a full revolution, which is still slower than Earth, Earth body, right? Which takes one day, 24 hours. Um, all these are given to Earth days. So it's possible that early on the whole planet was moving quick, uh, faster, but as the planet gets, as the climate changed, or, or perhaps was always pretty bad, and the atmosphere got thicker and thicker and thicker, it's possible that the atmosphere applied a torque that despun or, or slowed the rotation of the solid body, such that the atmosphere keeps going with its own inertia, but it's the solid body that slows down. That's how the atmosphere ends up super rotating. By that measure, perhaps it's better to say that the planet subrotates. But we don't know this. We've never had a good measurement of exactly what's driving super rotation or the role, if any, of things like sunlight. So I don't think we know the answer to that question for sure yet. We just have some ideas. Um, there's a question from Gershon, is there dust? Uh, there probably is dust. Um, it depends on what you mean by dust. Of course, dust when you say on the moon or Mars is usually very small fragments, very sharp fragments of rock. 
Um, if we're correct in terms of understanding how some of the tesserae are weathered, in terms of wind slowly having its way with the rock and just you know, wearing it away, then a lot of the eroded material is probably relatively rounded. And so it would probably be similar to sand and perhaps dust. Um, one of the most effective ways you get dust, again, those tiny fragments of shards of, of rock on Mars or Mercury or, or the moon is you have impacts. You've impact gardening and, and basically minor micrometeorite bombardment, particularly on airless worlds. And you don't have that on Venus. So there is not going to be a layer of regolith on Venus the way there is in these other worlds, simply because the atmosphere protects the surface from small impactors. There's, it's been hypothesized that there is a lot of debris of, of, of ejected from impact craters. But like I said, there aren't that many impact craters. Some of them are quite old. Um, it's also been hypothesized that there might be way more volcanic explosive activity than we currently recognize because it's difficult to distinguish at radar. Uh, there are about 80% of the surface of Venus is radar smooth at the wavelength of the radar, which is about 12 centimeters from Magellan. And that has been taken to indicate that the rock is relatively flat lying and, and it's an easy jump to say that might actually be uh, lava. The, the issue is that other things that are not lava could also look the same. And of course, we've no direct chemical data. And even if it were made of the same material, it could have been, made, been placed or put there in a different way. So huge portions of the surface of, of Venus could be pyroclastic ash, volcanic ash. We would have no direct way of telling. We have no direct way of telling. Um, and of course, that would have all kinds of implications for the planet's interior and what it was made of and its history and stuff. So we have some self-consistent models of Venus, but huge knowledge gaps, huge knowledge gaps. Um, Matthew Hyle asks, terrific presentation. Thank you, Matthew. As I understand it, in the Mars discussion, the lack of a magnetic field is thought to have resulted in the atmosphere being stripped from the planet. Why is that Venus's atmosphere escaped this fate? This is a big question. And I have had several, I've been at several workshops over the last 12 months where this exact question has come up in terms of what does this mean for planetary habitability generally? And the shorter answer is, we don't know. And, and most of the time, my answer to it will be, don't, we don't know, because we don't have enough data yet. However, what is telling is that from the limited data we have of Venus's atmospheric escape mechanisms and escape rates, meaning the amount of atmosphere Venus is losing, Venus seems to be losing about the same amount of atmosphere as Earth does, and about the same amount of atmosphere as Mars does. In other words, the presence or not of a minimum field doesn't seem to make that much difference, and solar distance doesn't seem to make all that much difference. And so this has led to a, a kind of a fundamental question. Is a magnetic and intrinsically generated magnetic field, is a dynamo necessary for life because of you know, shielding from radiation, but also retaining an atmosphere? And I think where at least my view is, is evolving to is that the answer is the magnetic field is much less important. What's probably more, much more important is the planet itself. Because let's say Mars is losing the same amount of atmosphere as Earth is and Venus is. Earth and Venus, one with and one without a magnetic field, probably, in the case of Venus, certainly in the case of Earth, have long lived continuous volcanism. So any atmosphere you're losing, you can effectively replenish by taking gas out of the interior. Whereas for Mars, the majority of its volcanic activity ended a long time ago. Mars is probably still volcanically active, but to very, very small amounts. And so even if Mars had a magnetic field, that doesn't protect the atmosphere completely. It might, the loss rate might be slower. But if Mars's volcanic activity fundamentally, like, you know, functionally shut down three billion years ago, then it doesn't really matter if you've got a magnetic field or not, although, of course, the two of them are linked. Uh, and it may just be that Venus and Mars, or Venus and Earth are able to replenish their atmosphere. So even if Venus is losing a huge amount of atmosphere, it's got a load of volcanoes. It's pumping that stuff back up out of the ground again. So I think it's probably much more to do with the planet itself, how big it is, how active it is, and how much gas it has in its mantle, uh, than whether or not it has a magnetic field. But the, that's not the last word. We, the short answer is we don't know. Oh, okay, I think there was a longer question from Gershon. Is there dust in the surface of, the, of Venus or particulate matter? Are the surface rocks the sedimentary deposits soluble in the overlying clouds? If so, are the erosions a sign of the effect of gravity on the solubility of the surface of the planet? No. Uh, the the H2SO4 will not reach the surface. It will not have much of an effect uh, chemically or physically on, on the surface materials. And like I said, there is some particulate material, but it's, it's probably less to do with micrometeorite bombardment and more to do with volcanic activity and, and just aeolian erosion. Uh, so John Burns asks, can you speak a little about the absence of the electromagnetic field, why and its effects? I've talked a bit about the effect or lack thereof. Why there isn't a magnetic field is a big unknown. And let me actually say something to be, to be quite precise here. We do not know for sure that Venus does not have an intrinsically generated field. We have been unable to detect one with orbiters. 
So that means that if it does have one, if it does, if it's present, then it's no more than one ten thousand as strong as Earth's field. But it could still have an intrinsically generated magnetic field. We just haven't detected it. And that's, what, that's a science question we have. Because one way you could rule that out would be if you had a balloon a few tens of kilometers over the atmosphere with a magnetometer, you could search for a magnetic field in a, because the strength of the magnetic field will decay one over R squared, right, the inverse square root. So, so we cannot say for sure it doesn't have one. It doesn't look like it has one. And I would put a lot of money that it does. We don't know that it doesn't for sure. We also don't know if there's any evidence of what's called a remnant magnetic field. So you may know that we have rocks on Earth that show evidence of there being those rocks in place as lavas under a magnetic field billions of years ago. We know that there's remnant magnetism in some of the ancient lunar rocks. We know there's remnant ancient magnetism in some of the Martian rocks and in the Mercurian surface. We found evidence for a magnetic field present there 3.8 billion years ago. Mercury also generates its own magnetic field. It's about a hundredth the strength of Earth's field. We do not know if Mercury's modern field is the same field that was present 3.8 billion years ago. It turns out it's extremely difficult to explain that physically. It may be that it had two fields, one back then and then another one more recently. So we don't know that Venus didn't once have one. And it may be that perhaps the Tesserae or some other very old rock, relatively speaking, might actually preserve evidence of, of having been in place when there was a magnetic field. Um, so in other words, we actually don't know that much about the history of magnetism on Venus. Why isn't there one there? There's two things you need to generate a magnetic field in a, a rocky planet. It's a bit different for a gas planet, for a gas giant, but for Earth, you need two things. You need a liquid iron core, but you also need an inner solid core, preferably. Because as that inner solid core is freezing, as the iron is freezing from liquid to solid, it's hard to imagine it as freezing, but it is. It's releasing latent heat of freezing, and that's driving the energy that's keeping the liquid core molten. And it's helping the liquid core spin in one coherent way. The core has to spin in a coherent way because it could be that you had a, a solid iron core in Venus and an outer liquid core, just like Earth. But if for reasons unknown, perhaps tied to its rotation period, I don't know, if those flow lines are not all aligned, you don't generate a coherent dynamo. Or you have a completely liquid inner core and it's doing whatever the hell it wants, no dynamo. Or you have a completely solid core and there is no prospect of generating in any field from liquid iron, no dynamo. And we don't have enough information to rule any in or out any of those three scenarios. Not yet. We will, but we don't yet right now. So I can't tell you very much about why it doesn't, but I can give you some of, there are some of the ideas as to why it might not. But bear in mind, it could also, it may, maybe it does have a magnetic field. We just don't know for sure. Uh, John Bory asks, how much does atmospheric density vary between highlands and lowlands? N negligibly. Negligibly. It's horrible. I get a few bars, maybe. Well, not even a few bars, a few millibars. Uh, temperature changes, I think it's a degree every kilometer. But functionally, you, you die just as fast on the highlands as you do in the plains, unfortunately. Um, well, at the rotation of the atmosphere, what are the surface winds? This is kind of an, a bit of an unknown question. We, we have very, very limited in situ measurements. One of, a couple of the Venera landers suggested that wind speeds are off order about a meter per second, which is kind of pathetic. However, the atmospheric density is 90 times that. So yeah, a one meter per second wind is kind of nothing if you're outside. But imagine a diver somehow being able to be alive at 900 meters depth hit by a current of a meter per second, F equals MV. So the kinetic energy of, of the wind is extremely potent. Um, one of the big, uh, there's so much, and I'm gonna try and again, I, I want you guys to have the rest of your afternoon. There's so many things we don't know about Venus. One of the surprising things is that there, there was only, there's only about two dune fields found on Venus with Magellan data. And the, the, you know, going back to a paper that Ron Greedy wrote in 84, he was arguing that on the basis of F equals MV, the atmosphere should be capable of doing a huge amount of erosion, carrying a huge amount of material. And yet we only found two dune fields. That's possible because somehow our understanding of the physics of the atmosphere is wrong, or just that we, the radar data we have are not able to pick up all the aeolian deposits happening on the surface. It could be that the surface is much more active aeolian-wise, in terms of wind eroding stuff away and depositing it than we recognize because we're limited with the radar data we have. So it's, it's very hard right now in a variety of ways to say either Venus doesn't have something or we haven't found it yet. 
Um, will uh, Da Vinci be looking for a magnetic field as it descends? You know, I don't know, but I don't think it's going to have a magnetometer. There are issues with flying a magnetometer on a spacecraft, and one of them is that you critically need is what's called um, magnetic cleanliness. You want to make sure the magnetometer or the, the, the magnetic instrument is preferably quite far a couple of meters minimum from the vehicle. Otherwise you're picking up the magnetic field of, of the metal you're, you're attached to. That's technologically challenging to do for something in the atmosphere. You can do it in a balloon on a probe, as far as I know, is not carrying a magnetometer. It's easier to do on a spacecraft because you can have long booms that separate it by a few meters. Um, it's challenging to do for, for, for um, a probe. So as far as I know, Da Vinci is not doing that. I, I'm trying to convey to people when I give these talks generally that even though we have these three missions, and I cannot begin to tell you how exciting this is for someone who does Venus, is a Venus evangelical like myself. The fact is we are going to need many more missions to really start to you know, answer and tackle all the questions we have. Unfortunately, it's going to take a while. But these three missions are terrific first steps in this new renewed history or our era of Venus exploration. So I don't see any other questions from anybody. And we're now at 20 past the hour. Thank you everyone very much for, for attending and, and for your great questions. And, and, and I hope I've done something to kind of convince